In Western Europe, we live in one of the wealthiest corners of this world. And yet, we force refugees to live in appalling conditions. In camps that look like this, for example. In 2015, when thousands of people started to arrive at the borders of Europe, I became part of the grassroots response to this so-called European refugee crisis. Because, like many others, I just couldn't quite comprehend that scenes, like in these pictures, are really unfolding in our own backyard. Over the next couple of years, I saw many things I never expected to ever see in Europe. I saw thousands of people sleeping on dirt, without access to water, shelter, food and toilets. I met a woman who had been gang raped by six men repeatedly, and she was forced to live in a tent next to them for several months. At one point, I worked in a camp where up to 6,000 people had to share eight showers. I have a background in development and humanitarian aid, and I'm quite familiar with the typical excuses of why it takes three months to build a toilet in a camp somewhere in Afghanistan, or why refugees still live without proper shelter five years after the disaster in Haiti happened. But none of these excuses really work in Europe. In Europe, no aid worker has to be afraid of being killed by a sniper. And it's a lot easier to ship a few containers of aid to Greece than to a war zone somewhere in Syria. We also have more than sufficient funding, considering the number of people we're dealing with. In Greece, for example, less than 1% of the entire population are refugees or people seeking asylum. In Lebanon, it's more than 25%. I think it's quite obvious. The humanitarian system has become unfit to deal with today's crises. It's also no secret that it has been struggling and been held hostage by politics and by bureaucracy for quite a while now. But what is the point of having a massive aid industry if the needs of affected people can't be met, not even in Europe? And I think this question becomes even more relevant when you compare the official response to the unofficial response of organized groups of volunteers who work with less and often achieve more. And the response is often also quicker, more flexible and more humane than the traditional response. And just to be clear, I'm not just talking about small projects, I'm talking about big, scalable solutions that have managed to offer food, shelter, medical support, and many other things for tens of thousands of people so far. So I started asking myself, what do grassroots groups do differently? And I want to suggest three takeaway lessons we can learn from their efforts. Lesson number one, we need to put solidarity above charity. You see, the traditional humanitarian system is based on a charity approach. And this means that it looks at people who are affected by a crisis as a beneficiary and not as a partner. The grassroots response, on the other hand, grew out of solidarity with fellow humans. And solidarity is based on a principle of shared ownership. It means to work together rather than for someone. To give you um, a few examples of what this difference looks like in reality, here are some scenes I observed in Greece. First, I want to show you some examples of food distributions based on the logics of charity. In this picture, you can see how bread is thrown out of the back of a truck. Whoever catches it can keep it. 
Or here you can see a very common image of refugees standing in lines for hours and hours every single day in order to get their meals. And here you can see the actual meals. I'll let you judge if it's worth the wait. Food distributions based on a logic of solidarity look different. For example, in a community center we built in Athens, together with many refugees themselves, we built a big kitchen where refugees now cook food for up to a thousand people each day. And they decide what meals they want to cook, and they decided to serve it restaurant style, simply because that's more dignified than having to stand in lines for everything. Or here you can see a community kitchen set up by another grassroots group in one of the camps. And in this camp, every family can just cook for themselves. So the point is, there is a lot more pride and dignity in doing things and deciding things for yourself and in taking responsibility over your own life than in being given things without having any say over what you're given and how you're given it. Lesson number two, we need flexible funding. So big NGOs are often very donor-driven, and their response can become dependent on the priorities and interests of their donors, which can be both private and public institutions. And on one hand, this can obviously lead to um, problematic conflicts of interests. And on the other hand, NGOs sometimes forget to engage with real people's problems in the process of writing report after report for their donors. Grassroots groups mostly opt for crowdfunding money for specific projects or to give directly to refugees in one form or another. And of course, transparency is still important, but I think this may actually work better because it allows to use the funds to cover the actual needs of people in real time. And there are more and more examples that show that this strategy is also possible on a larger scale. Lesson number three. We need innovation and a more up-to-date response. Very slow and bureaucratic organizations they often look a bit like inefficient dinosaurs to a new generation of tech-savvy and entrepreneurial minds. Most members of the grassroots response grew up in a digital era, and I think they know better how to leverage the speed and the flexibility of our time. And because most of them don't have a background in the traditional aid sector, they often come up with methods and solutions that might seem quite unconventional for the traditional aid system, a system that almost hasn't changed since it was established after the Second World War. To give you an example of this, remember the picture I showed you in the beginning? This is actually a picture of the official Camp Moria on Lesbos. It was taken in January of this year. When I arrived there two years ago, the Camp was already completely overcrowded and hundreds of people were sleeping outside of this camp in the mud. They didn't have anything and no NGOs were present. Within only a couple of weeks, we managed to build up an actually quite well-functioning informal camp for about 800 people just outside of this official camp. This is what our camp looked like. And Though we were only a few people with literally no money, we had technology and we had social media. So some of us set up crowdfunding campaigns and then we used Facebook and other social media channels to get other teams of um, volunteers with relevant skills to come help us. There was, for example, a group from Holland that usually works in the festival industry and they used their networks to get festival infrastructure shipped to the island. So suddenly we had really expensive, high-quality tents we could use. And some of them also had very useful knowledge and skills regarding things like waste management or sanitary provision, but also things like power or sight lightning for safety and crowd control. I know it sounds a bit ironic, but Building a festival and building a temporary refugee camp 
actually has quite a few similarities. Another team that usually runs a food waste catering business in England showed up shortly after and built, they built a food tent. And within only a few days, they managed to establish links with local supermarkets where they could pick up the food waste each evening and make it into nice meals. And one team even established a delivery system to bring the items from the different warehouses on the island to the camps. And this system worked a bit like Uber, except that it was free and that we used WhatsApp to ask for the deliveries of the items we needed. So you see, a lot of new ideas and solutions were developed, and not just in Greece, I mean across all European countries. People started countless of initiatives to help newcomers find jobs and flats and bicycles and friends and all of the other things we need in order to live a more or less normal life. What we are seeing in Europe these days will stay with us for a long time. Migration is not going to go away, and people will continue to be displaced. So rather than building walls and looking back to a time when things were better, we should look forward and come up with realistic solutions that work in today's world. Solutions that are not based on old logics of humanitarian assistance and charity, but on new practices of solidarity and autonomy. We need flexible funding and we need innovative new ideas. Because it's 2017 and no refugee in Europe should be forced to live in camps that look like this. In camps where human rights are being abused and where inhumane living conditions regularly lead to deaths. If we want to stop failing refugees, we need to act now and have the courage to keep fighting for new solutions. Thank you. Thank you.